Hey, hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Development by David podcast. I'm so delighted that you stopped by for this one because our guest today is Dr. Eric Daimler. Dr. Eric is a leading or the leading authority in robotics and artificial intelligence with over 30 years of experience as an entrepreneur, investor, technologist and policymaker. My claim to fame here is that Eric served under Barack Obama and the Obama administration as Presidential Innovation Fellow for AI and Robotics in the Executive Office of President. He was the sole authority, the only individual driving the agenda for the US leadership in research, commercialization and public adoption of AI and robotics. So, what do we speak about in this episode? Well, we underpin what AI is in plain English, when it dates back, we understand what the future of AI might, AI might look like in terms of replacing jobs, we speak about what the most in-demand skill will be like in 10 years. We speak about the regulation that underpins AI at the moment and the future of that. We ask, should we feel safe at the hands of technologists? We cover all things augmented reality, virtual reality and the metaverse. We speak about the two camps when considering AI adoption. We have the adopters and the opponents. We ask, what will it take to bridge the gap between the two? He speaks about his own background and of course working within the White House for President Obama leading this agenda. What a fascinating, illuminating conversation. I hope you stick around to the end. You might need a notepad and pen. It was so technical, but I think, and I don't even think I know Dr. Eric broke it down in plain English using amazing examples, whether it was driverless cars, Airbus A380s. He was brilliant. Let's get into it. But before that, if you feel generous and you want to caffeinate me for a future podcast, I have a buymeacoffee.com link in my bio where you can donate me a coffee to spark the discussion with my next guest. You don't need to do this. Of course you don't. I don't expect you to do this, but a lot of hours and work and capital go into this podcast. And I'm thankful for it because it's a lifesaver. It's my favourite hobby. But if you want to contribute to make it even more worthwhile, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com. The link's in the bio. Thanks for sticking around. Let's get into it. Eric Daimler, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well, David. It's good to be here. I am really, really privileged to have you on the show today. You're probably the paragon of a leader in your industry, an industry that I and many of the listeners probably know nothing about yet. That being said, who is Eric Daimler today in 2022? Well, thank you for that kind, that kind setup, David. Uh, you know, if, if people know me uh, uh, by, for anything, I, I, they, they'll often know me for having been the AI authority during the Obama administration. So for the last year uh, there, I was the, uh, the, the, the expert in AI. There's experts in a lot of different areas of science. It was a in, in computer science, it was an uh, expert in computer security there. Uh, and then, of course, there's other experts in uh, uh, space and, and, and medicine, but I was the AI guy for the time. Uh, I have been uh, fortunate to uh, have spent 30, 30 plus years in and around AI in various capacities, uh, you know, from that most recent experience in policy, uh, but also starting my career as a researcher uh, and later faculty member in AI uh, and then spending time as a venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road and uh, a multiple time entrepreneur. So I have this uh, uh, panoply of experiences uh, in and around AI uh, from from being an entrepreneur, businessman, researcher, and in policy. That's a, uh, you know, I guess a, a rare, if not unique uh, set of experiences. Such an esteemed and decorated career to be proud of. And I've heard you on so many podcasts already. And it's fascinating to see so many technical podcasts out there diving into the deep nitty gritty content of AI. But I haven't yet heard you unfold your kind of genesis story. And as you're aware, that's the whole theme of this podcast. It was the motivation for me starting it. So from academic or from academic origin to modern day, with a little glimpse into the future, let's take it back to day one. Where did the curious eye for technology start? You know, I am uh, uh, really grateful for uh, uh, the the accident of birth that had me choose my parents well. 
uh, uh, where uh, my they were terrific, uh, terrific people, and that got me uh, uh, in, in started, I guess, with a an, an ability to explore uh, a wide range uh, of interests. So I, you know, among the things that I did uh, at a young age, uh, one was to uh, uh, be able to experiment in various areas of technology. At, at the at the time, you know, this was a, a little burst of activity in early versions uh, of AI. So uh, I uh, was uh, exposed to the popular imagination uh, of AI at the time. And, and this took form uh, with me sitting in a basement surrounded by a lot of electronics in building my first computer, I think when I was 10. Uh, uh, so that was, you know, it was a kit computer, right? You know, not, uh, but I did my own soldering, uh, uh, put it, putting together my own computer. And that that it, uh, was a window into uh, even my 10 year old self, uh, a, a, a freedom, uh, a type of expressiveness that I saw available uh, in, in my little precocious self where, uh, to, to think about this is a way in which we could express ourselves, a way in which greater humanity could express ourselves. And uh, that, that sent me on a trajectory uh, to uh, uh, finish high school early and, and start attending the University of Washington, Seattle, and then uh, later, uh, two other uh, universities, Stanford and, and Carnegie Mellon University, where I was later on the on the computer science faculty. Uh, so I, I have enjoyed uh, the, the the evolution uh, of AI uh, and and it, having it enter into uh, the public discourse. And now I am on a mission to bring everybody onto the field to have a conversation about how we want this technology to. Uh, express itself uh, relative to our society values. That's what we need uh, is we need to be able to embrace uh, what is often this life-saving technology uh, into our day-to-day -day experience. Uh, it, it, the extent to which it fulfills uh, our, our dreams uh, or is closer to a Hollywood dystopia uh, <laughs> you know, is, is up to us. There's so many parts of that intro that I want to get back to, but first of all, and I don't want to lick my finger and put it in the air to guess how old you are, but you said you had an esteemed career over 30 years. Right now, I have so many friends and colleagues working in technology, but 30 years ago, was the appetite for a career in technology the same, and how was that perceived by your family and friends and inner circle? Was it as um, fetishized as it is now in terms of um, career prospects? It was fetishized for me. I mean, at 53, and at the time, uh, you know, I was I was working to be uh, an Olympic athlete uh, in the American cycling team. But in my in the locker of my high school uh, was not uh, athletes or or or, in, or cars. It was uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. Uh, it's quite literally, uh, uh, you know, and, and Mitch Kapoor at the time, the founder of of, of what was then Lotus. Uh, th these were my idols, the people I, I looked up to at a very uh, a weirdly young age, looking back at it. Were there any synergies between athleticism and cycling and your studies and career? Did they kind of marry at all? You know, the terrific part about uh, cycling for me was the degree of focus uh, that, e that either required of me uh, uh, or engendered as a character trait that I built up. Uh, and it, it's that singular uh, point of focus uh, with an additional uh, generous, generous helping of persistence is I think what, uh, uh, what I think I uh, uh, have been uh, nurturing uh, throughout, uh, throughout my career. I think, I think you know, a lot of people actually get confused about what it means to have a PhD. And I, I don't think it actually takes that much smarts but I'll tell you, it takes a massive amount of persistence, a massive amount of tenacity. Uh, I think I, I have a PhD not in smarts, but in tenacity. <laughs> PhD in tenacity. That is going to be my um, soundbite of this podcast. I love it. How did your career transpire after your PhD? I admire that you've worked from within investment banks through to executive office. You've pioneered I believe six startups have found the time to write a book uh, and you're one of the founders of the Silicon Valley campus, I believe, at Carnegie Mellon. Let's unpick that exciting career. What was your first node after education? You know, I uh, 
really enjoyed uh, college, uh, 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 you know, high school a little less though, but <laughs> college I enjoyed quite a bit. Uh, uh, and I uh, in- enrolled in business school and then enrolled at a PhD. And I, I you know, I, I, I dropped out of both of those, be- I, I'd like to say before it was fashionable, uh, uh, in order to take a, uh, a job that I couldn't refuse in London, uh, coincidentally. Uh, I, I was part of a team that traveled around the world. Uh, I, I was the quant guy, uh, the math guy uh, behind these very complex models that we would generate to uh, evaluate the, uh, uh, the, the credit worthiness of, of countries uh, and very large companies. And that was a great time, terrific people uh, with whom I worked in that, uh, uh, during that time. Uh, what, what changed was uh, I ultimately did go back to, to, to finish my PhD. So I dropped that once, but I went, I went back to, to finish it. But what, what changed in there for me was, uh, timing has a lot to do in, in my, uh, trajectory. I think I, I, I could generalize that to say that's some sort of life truth, but it, it certainly has been for me. Uh, but what was a big deal in my experience was the introdu- introduction of the Mosaic browser. Uh, you know, this is often predates perhaps a lot of your l- uh, listeners, but you know, for me, it, it happened early in my career. And, and I guess I can, I can use this as a little uh, 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 segue. You know, often uh, it, it's been said that uh, uh, any technology that is invented before someone hits, I think the, the, the general rule is like what, 15 or so, that's considered to just be uh, uh, laws of nature, you know, the background. That's just stuff that exists in the in the firmament of society. Any technology that's invented between uh, uh, when I turn uh, uh, 15 and we'll say 30 is uh, stuff I might be able to build my career around. And then any technology that's invented after I turn 30 uh, against the law of nature, you know, it's unnatural, uh, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, wherever people uh, grow up relative to developments in tech, uh, can often influence their career choices more than they may want to uh, admit. For me, I uh, uh, knew about the uh, the internet, uh, you know, since as long as I can remember. I mean, the internet existed before I was born, uh, uh, but it didn't exist as a as a popular technology, a, a technology uh, uh, that was available for for non technical people uh, until 1994. Uh, and so it was around, it was after that time when the browser then became available and I, I saw the Mosaic browser. We were, I was at, in New York uh, working for another bank, uh, uh, again, as a quant, uh, uh, and people were, if you, you know, these are smart people. They're all huddled around the screen after hours. And so on, on one of those big trading floors where, that you see, uh, you know, in the, in the movies, uh, uh, and everybody's huddled around this screen and they're looking at the Mosaic browser and they're, they're all kind of curious looking at it. Like, I don't know what I'm going to use this for. I think this is kind of, kind of funky. And, and I think, oh, oh, oh my gosh. I mean, I had an out of body experience. It was, it was one of those times that people reflect in their lives about, uh, uh, not knowing or remembering where they were when that happened. And so for me, uh, I, uh, I remember everything about that time when that happened. Uh, I, I think it, when I, when I saw the mosaic browser, I just had an out of body experience to, I can, I can re- recall it in my body right now. Uh, and I think it, it, it may not have been a day, but it was within a week that I quit that job. Uh, and I, I moved out to, uh, the West Coast of the United States, uh, looking for how to say, "Hey, man, this is where I need to be. Uh, I I need to be engaged in this. This is what I'm built for, not to be working at a bank." What's so special about the West Coast of the states then? Why is that an epicenter for technology? Well, I I don't know if I have anything to add beyond uh, w- what other people uh, have said uh, that 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 study that sort of thing full time. Uh, you know, for me. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley was, and it, and it still is, uh, really by far the the leader in in in, in bringing together uh, uh, technologists and uh, that therefore fund companies and build build uh, great companies. Uh, so I uh, went out to look for uh, opportunities there, uh, uh, and I also had uh, found one uh, in Seattle where there was this. Uh, 
this company that uh, uh, said that they were going to be big by selling books. Uh, so I got a job offer from that company as well. Was that off? Was that organization Amazon by any chance? It, it was. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. You know, nobody knew uh, that it would be what it was today. But but I interviewed and got an offer from from Jeff Bezos back when it was a small firm, very very small firm. I like these sliding door moments. How different do you think your career would have been if you took that offer? Yeah, well, my my, my mother would likes to remind me about that question all the time, so I uh, <laughs> I can give you there's various ways of answering that, but uh, I I have no regrets. I I I I have a great a great life. I'm, I'm very fortunate for the uh, the the experiences that I've had, the the friends and family uh, that I have, and I uh, I. I been able to, uh, uh, I think, make a contribution and hopefully we'll still have a lot of uh, years ahead where I can uh, continue to make a contribution and bring other people into the conversation. The world is a better place for it, Eric. You speak about when you remember that thing happening, when it was the Mosaic browser for you. Have you had that same sensation since? Was there anything else where you stopped besides something like 9-11 or some sort of huge existential um, crisis like covid do you remember anything else from a technology point of view where you've had to stop and digest much like you did with the Mosaic browser? Uh, yes, but not quite so acute. So there, there definitely has been other uh, transformations. You know, timing, like I said in other parts of this uh, context, is, is, is a lot, if not everything, uh, around these uh, conversations. So uh, you know, it was obvious uh, to me, it's obvious to a lot of people, uh, that the, the the devices that we had held in our hands in the late uh, late 90s or the early 2000s were going away, but it would have been foolish for anybody to pretend uh, that they could have given advice, uh, uh, career advice, that there was an, a, a, a career called app developer. Uh, but, you know, like that didn't exist, you know, to say nothing of influencer, right? People, you would have been laughed at, you know, not so long ago as that being a career opportunity and you know, obviously the, the whole casino of, of, of uh, cryptocurrencies. But uh, uh, there is um, uh, a, a fool's errand in trying to predict the, the future beyond a couple of years with any level of fidelity. Uh, it's really about how you adopt to uh, what, what you see. You know, my company that I had started right before the financial crisis uh, was recognized at the Wall, at the Wall Street Journal as one uh, that uh, used cloud computing in a, 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 a enterprise uh, effective way, I guess we'll say, uh, before anybody else. So they wanted to write a profile piece on us about this. We were a little shy uh, because we were doing something that uh, used cloud computing as a competitive advantage. We were able to train these financial models using uh, uh, a tenth, maybe a hundredth, but we, we generally said a tenth of the compute of the cost of the computing power that we would have been able to do uh, using other methods. So they thought that was super innovative. And that was like what 2005, 2006. Uh, uh, we uh, we didn't want to do that profile, but that that was an epiphany for me to saying, "Wow, this is definitely coming. This is where the world is going." Uh, uh, you know, had had I been in a different frame of mind, I would have. Uh, you know, thought of other expressions of the future of cloud computing. But, you know, that was, what, a decade or more before it starts entering the public discourse. We need to talk about your time in the Obama administration. How did you get called up for a role like that, Eric? How did you know you were the man for the role? And what did you deliver when you were there? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can say... Uh, uh, you know that is a, a, a as cool as you think it is. Um, uh, as cool as you think it was, you know, it was. Uh, I, and I hope to be able to go back uh, at some point and 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 serve uh, the American people in, uh, uh, in in a similar role or or, or some other role uh, that fits my experience. That was just a, a, a really great time. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, a little awkward because I, I lived in San Francisco at the time with uh, with my family, so. Uh, we had to, and, and they did not want to go to, they don't want to go to DC. So uh, we, we moved to New York and I actually commuted from New York to Washington, DC uh, with, uh, with just a, an apartment or a, a room, large, 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 nice room in Washington, DC for a year. Uh, that was a, 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 a nice way to uh, 
not have that be a good financial decision. I'll tell you, the, the funny thing about working for the U.S. government is it does not pay well. Uh, and so I have a lot of uh, a lot of sympathy for the uh, and a lot of respect for the people that do those jobs out of the out of public service. Um, uh, and, and, and I can see why they do it. I really enjoyed the people uh, with whom I worked and enjoyed uh, the work uh, that we did there. We we worked with. Uh, uh, the, the other branches of the U.S. government, and then to some extent with U.S. allies in uh, formulating how to even think about a rollout of AI and robotics uh, more generally over the next 10 years. What would the research look like? What would the deployments look like? How can we even coordinate the, uh, the definitions uh, uh, of, of these terms? Since then, it's really terrific that uh, some of the people with whom I worked had been able to expand uh, what what was started in that uh, last year into now an office of AI, an AI office. So uh, where where there was once uh, you know one person working in that capacity uh, as the AI authority, now there's multiple people uh, within the, the the U.S. White House working uh, as as experts uh, in AI, and it's also expanded in the other branches of the uh, executive uh, executive branch of the government. So there's a lot more expertise. Uh, brought to bear. I'd like to think, yeah, it, it took five people to do the job that I did, but you know, the, it's been recognized that the the job is now bigger. You know, AI is now just a bigger deal, uh, and so it's been able to support uh, a bigger allocation of resources. Given the insight into the commute that you had to undertake, the kind of remuneration from the government in terms of salary, what? What was it that was innate to you that motivated you to see through that role and ultimately prove its necessity um, to the point that we now have five people working in that team? What, what got you out of bed in the morning almost? You know, President Obama had said at the time that if you uh, don't have uh, uh, chills uh, uh, every time you walk through the door, you're in the wrong job. Uh, and that, that was certainly uh, uh, true for me. I definitely uh, felt that. Uh, it was a big deal every single day. Uh, uh, you know, I, I came in with as, as many biases as anybody would in uh, thinking about a bureaucracy and the, the slowness of government and uh, you know how these uh, the, these these large organizations can't really respond to the needs of society, uh, and you know that might all, all all be true in some in some respect. But the people with whom I worked on the problems before us uh, was motivating uh, every single day. Uh, I really enjoyed the work uh, that that we did, both in helping to uh, frame a conversation for Congress, where we were interacting with. Uh, representatives in the U.S. Congress and in the Senate uh, with some degree of frequency about how to define AI for them and represent it to their constituents, uh, all the way to defining where we want to uh, uh, focus our uh, research uh, over the next uh, decade. Those were just really terrific uh, places uh, to be. And it's from that perspective that I also, uh, for, for my own benefit, was just able to see from these very large AI deployments where were the blockers, you know, where were uh, governments in this particular case, but also other large organizations uh, likely to be disappointed with their return on investment uh, into uh, AI. Uh, and so I saw that with with a degree of clarity that would have been difficult from any other perspective. You know, it was at that time where. Uh, companies were just beginning their journey towards collecting more data. It was just in that time where uh, uh, that, that cliche of data being the new oil and all that uh, began to take shape and, and, and enter, enter our, uh, our discourse. Uh, that, I think, has, has played out where uh, you know, we, we see uh, big data being to somewhat uh, being old news. Uh, today, uh, we we know that the day the rate of data growth is is exponential, or or to be more exact, quadratic. Uh, what what is less appreciated is that the number of data sources, call it IoT, from anything that, that the lidar on top of my car to the air quality in my house, 
the number of data sources is also growing quadratically. So the limitation that is going to be experienced, is being experienced by these large organizations, is the guaranteed integrity of the data relationships, the connections between data. You know, the, the data about me, you know, my age, my, my, my height, my eye color, you know, that's not terribly interesting to Delta Airlines, for example. But what is interesting to Delta Airlines is their proprietary way, this is their knowledge, their data relationship, their proprietary ability to relate that data uh, of how often I will fly from San Francisco to London. Uh, and the degree to which they then make a decision about whether I'm worthy of, of some inducement to fly on Delta uh, 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 more frequently. That sort of data relationship represents the, uh, the, the real intellectual property of large organizations. That integrity of knowledge is uh, near impossible to uh, continue with classic uh, uh, with classic approaches. And that solution is, is, is where we're going. The solution to that uh, is at a different level. I feel like we have almost flirted with the listener. We have dangled the carrot in front of the stick. Let's, let's do what we set out to achieve. What is AI in plain English then? How would you describe it? What does it mean to you personally? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I, how I describe AI to, to members of Congress. Uh, uh, and, then, and then we could talk about where it's, where it's going and how to maybe get involved in the conversation. So there's a distinction perhaps about what is the, a useful definition of AI and then what is a, a, a correct definition of AI. So I'm going to give the useful definition, all right? So the useful definition is uh, a, a system that learns from the collection of data, the planning uh, and the acting, uh, and then learning from that experience. So sensing, planning, acting, and learning from the experience. So we talked about the collection of data perhaps being from IoT, from a, any number of different sources. Increasingly, even smart appliances, your, your kitchen appliances, your microwave, your dishwasher. You know, my dishwasher, as a little aside, my dishwasher will phone the manufacturer uh, to uh, uh, to tell it, oh, I'm going to have maintenance uh, you know, coming up. You should probably give uh, uh, give our owner a call. So <laughs> collection of data is expanding. That collection of data then goes through the network to be planned. That's the domain we traditionally think of uh, around AI. So we have sensing and then planning. And then what do we do about it? So another example when we say what to do about it is we have an automated car going, driving down the street. And that automated car sees some things in front of it. Is it a crosswalk? Is it a shadow on the crosswalk? Is it a person? That's in the planning, in the judgment, we might say. Well, then there's the acting. What then happens? Does the car uh, ignore it? Does the car just keep going at the same speed? Does the car ask for driver intervention? Or does the car slow down or come to a complete stop? So that's the acting, where it's sensing, planning, acting, and then learning from the experience. And that last part distinguishes this from an ordinary thermostat from the 1980s. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not just going to say, oh, I'm hot enough now, I will, I will stop heating, uh, or I'm cool enough now, I will stop cooling. It's learning from the experience that, oh, David gets home uh, uh, around, around 7 p.m. on Fridays. Uh, I'm going to start heating the house. That'd be learning from the experience. So sensing, planning, acting, learning from the experience. That whole system is what I think of as a useful framework when thinking about AI. Now, that's distinguished from the pedantic definition, which would say that the deep learning in our common, uh, ordinary public discourse that you can read about in the Times of London or the Wall Street Journal is a, uh, a currently has these fashionable foundation models that are themselves subsets of machine learning that is themselves a subset of AIs that then says, well, we have a non we have non machine learning AIs inside of uh, deterministic algorithms. That's the proper way to talk about it. But that's, that, that, that pedantic definition is really mm -hmm. useful to the very small minority that are AI researchers. It's not really useful when, when having most of society talk about how we want these technologies to express themselves relative to our values and whether or not we as a society want the car to keep going slow or stop.
So that's how I think about uh, AI today uh, uh, from being useful to uh, having a pedantically uh, correct definition. I love your useful definition. I think it <laughs> garners more congruence. It gathers more community. I'll It broke it down in plain English for me, and I'm sure it did as well for the, the listeners listening at home. So how far does AI date back? So the, the, uh, the, the mythology says that it started at this conference in uh, Dartmouth. Uh, 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 boy, I think it's, it's now going to come up on, what, 70 years or so? Uh, uh, where uh, uh, it, it was thought at the time the, the, the problem of these computers learning would be uh, solved in a good summer. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the definition has changed uh, a little bit. And, and we're now living with these slightly different definitions. Uh, you know, the, the term AI obviously was, was not ever really meant to be accurate. Uh, it was really meant to be uh, to, uh, somewhat of a scary term. And, and right now, you know, if, I, if I had to choose, and I think a lot of researchers would agree with me, that we might choose a different term because it's a little strange. Uh, 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 it doesn't quite describe what we're, what we're going for, and it gets conflated with these uh, uh, other weird concerns that demand a different level of attention. You know, we often think of sentience that's in the news uh, recently from uh, the latest Google innovation. Uh, we often think of these malevolent sentient uh, uh, AIs from the, the Hollywood uh, uh, movies. That's not not a, a really uh, useful place to play because there are a lot of uh, AIs and expressions of AIs that are either going to do good or damage to us way before uh, this concern about sentience uh, takes takes reasonable form. I think some amount of attention, like Nis, uh, Nick Bostrom, uh, is a is, is a great example. You know, Nick Bostrom wrote a uh, a terrific book. I think he, you know he's in the UK, uh, uh, and I think he's he's the guy that that Musk often uh, quotes and Bill Gates often quotes when they're talking about. Uh, the danger of sentient uh, AI. And so some amount of it, I think he's right in saying that some amount of attention could be placed on uh, that existential concern. But I, the, the, you know, the gen, my sense is that the general uh, feeling among AI researchers is that uh, sentience is uh, un, unlikely to, may never appear, unlikely to appear at all during our careers. And in any case, uh, uh, distracts us from this much larger set of dangers and opportunities uh, over the next 10 to 20 years about how we use uh, and deploy AI. How would you collate or collect and relay back to me the ambient dangers of AI? What's the general cause of concern? You know, I'll frame it as uh, uh, a set of actions that we can take uh, right now. So if we, there are 30 million computer programmers in the world, roughly. Uh, those 30 million computer programmers in the world uh, uh, will not necessarily uh, benefit by having 30 million and one computer programmers. <laughs> you know, they, we have a lot of computer programmers in the world. What we don't have a lot of is, is people interacting with that output as something other than uh, magic uh, or, or mystery. You know, those people... Are are I'm, I'll generally say with an assumption of they're being well-meaning. They they all have their court, own quarterly objectives, run with product managers, all trying to uh, deploy their own work in the best possible way. As a, a trained engineer, if I'm developing a technology that I think is cool, I think that it's even cooler to uh, scale my technology. One way to scale my technology is to link my technology to other technologies. There's a lot of ways to do this, but let's just say that that piece of technology is an automation. That automation could be linked to another set of automations. I can do this uh, infinitely at, 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 in my mind, and I might like to do that out in the world because it just scales my technology. It looks cool. It seems cool. I'm an engineer. <laughs> so what? How to take our earlier example, if we have an automated car, that automated car might be able to drive around. I mean, they can drive around. Uh, uh, the city with, with, with quite a bit of, of, of apparent skill. You know, outside my office here in San Francisco, 
uh, we have cars by Waymo uh, that are driving by every few minutes and also cars by Zooks and, and others all testing uh, uh, quite frequently about what the intersection looks like very, given the light patterns of that particular uh, time of day and, and, and uh, other attributes. That, uh, uh, that driving of the car can be interrupted by humans at the judgment of society. So that, it would not, that won't really be interrupted at the judgment of the, the product managers unless they're told by society, hey, we need to have a circuit breaker there. Uh, uh, it is beyond the judgment of our programmers to determine with the same degree of confidence if that car should slow, stop, or do nothing when interpreting a, 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 an image as a person, a shadow, uh, or a tumbleweed. So that's a way in which we as a society need to have a conversation. At some point, we will as a society need to determine where liability is placed. You know, will liability be placed with the programmer, with the manufacturer, right? Or with, or with the driver, which is where it currently is uh, in having uh, collisions, uh, unintended collisions uh, around cars. So that's an example uh, of how I think we as a society can get involved in that conversation and need to interpret what the, where the programmers uh, would otherwise express technology on their own, given their own incentives. And those cr can create the dangers we all read about every day from uh, uh, drones or autonomous vehicles to manipulation in the media, which is also a type of automation that's linked. I think that conversation around liability will illuminate my next question. Um, fellow members of the general population might think that we are, in fact, like worlds away from the hands that develop these technologies. Is there a reason in that case that us members from the gen pop should have more of a basic understanding of the technology? You know, I, uh, I, I think it's easy to say that, uh, yes, I'd like everybody to have a, a, a deeper level of understanding about digital technologies. Sure. Uh, I think about where to focus that effort uh, is, is a good place to, uh, to go next. Uh, I, I'm going to say the future is uh, around this conversation of uh, composable systems. That's really what where that the mean? world is going. Uh, we have, yeah, so we have uh, increasingly uh, complex systems emerging. If you look at any of our uh, commercial jetliners, they are more complex, more sophisticated than the jetliners uh, of a decade ago. You know, there are uh, uh, efforts right now to develop a new supersonic airplane, it is unrecognizable from the supersonic airplane uh, of our fathers or, or grandfathers, as it were. Uh, it's, it, these, are, these are emergent complex systems, emergent compositional uh, systems. The distinction between compositionality often gets conflated with modularity, but we can distinguish it here you know, modularity, we can all be familiar with when we talk about Lego blocks, but in the world, we'll see container ships, shipping containers that have thousands of these shipping containers, or we think of trains that can be, uh, that, that can interchange box cars. But those can only be a few kilometers long before you need to do something else. Compositionality, on the other hand, is more akin to the train system. And at a train system, at any point, you can expand infinitely. At any point, you can expand infinitely. Those are the, that's the distinction for compositionality versus modularity. Where we're, so there are emergent compositional systems. People are building more complex airplanes like everything else. What is important is that we reestablish a fundamental integrity to these increasingly complex systems so that as we build them, they don't have concomitant fragility because we don't want airplanes to crash more <laughs> often, right? We want airplanes to crash less often or, or we want to have their vulnerabilities be more predictable. And that is only available through this mathematics uh, of category theory. It's a domain of math that is this foundational uh, integrity guarantee. And it's in that that where uh, I think that uh, people 
especially kids uh, starting their careers, are going to benefit by putting their energy. You might say that more math, the better. Uh, so you might say the more technology, the better. Uh, you know, but if I were to choose, I would replace uh, geometry, trigonometry, and even calculus with statistics, probability, and category theory. That might just be my trailer clip, Eric. I love that. One of the tropes that I hear from my generation is that AI is replacing all jobs or is replacing knowledge work. Is AI creating more employment or enhancing unemployment in that case? This is a discussion we had all the time when I was in government. Uh, I, I think the, the best way to think about this is uh, as an individual. What's changed? What's different about digital technologies from all of their technologies that we can look back on over the last 100, 200 years is not that these technologies of automation, because that's what they are, uh, will necessarily replace jobs, because we've, we've replaced jobs all the time. Uh, you know, we might ha yearn for the, 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 the romanticism of, of people working at switchboards, at least as an abstraction, not if you were doing it, or, or you know, the elevator operators, uh, you know, to say nothing of the, the, the cliches of the, the horse and buggy. But, you know, nobody really shed a tear when the treasury bond traders really ceased to exist as a career, or the New York floor of the New York Stock Exchange today is more of a tourist attraction or a backdrop for journalists. Nobody sheds a tear on that, right? But those are jobs that have been eliminated. What's changed is the abruptness with which these jobs get eliminated. That's scary. So people get frightened rightly by thinking that their job could go away. But it's not that their job will go away and that they can't have their, their children pursue the same path. It's that their job may go away and they will get one month <laughs> notice. <laughs> have to shift careers. That's what's frightening. So I think the, the general assumption from, from my experience uh, in and around AI is that it actually may be neutral in creating jobs or, 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 or killing jobs, but the, the, the shock that it can create to a system in an individual or in a community can be uh, large indeed. And we as a society uh, need to really respect the uh, the feeling of displacement that individuals may have uh, in in having expectations shift. Uh, you know, the people like me, uh, you know, we're, we may be very well suited to be able to adapt. Th that's not a good assumption for uh, uh, to to have and to hold for most uh, of society. And I think that's a that's a way to frame. Uh, that argument that may be more useful in thinking about our, our own career choices uh, and policy Eric, responses. Looking at the future of skills, what skills will be in demand if AI does replace some of the kind of processing roles and existing roles that are out there? What skills will be in demand over the next decade? You know, the easy uh, answer, the popular answer to here is, is one that I agree with, which is to say anything that involves empathy. Uh, and the easy way to say that is because uh, there is, uh, uh, say, the, the last mile of having a computer replicate what a human does it would, it would be around empathy. You know, we, we, we don't understand it uh, as computer scientists, and, and it's really not where we gonna, we're going to try to replicate it with any sort of energy because there's so many other uh, places to go. But I'll give you a more useful uh, answer besides uh, building, building your empathetic skills. And it's working to have your implicit knowledge become explicit. That is one, going to be one of the skills of the next decade to nurture uh, for all subject matter experts. It is really inevitable that parts of your job will be peeled off uh, over the next decade. That's, that is the predictable way to think about how these technologies evolve. They, as much as we just talked about the abruptness with which jobs change, the deployment of these technologies really manifests itself in peeling off parts of technologies. You've noticed in automated cars that uh, we don't yet have fully autonomous cars, and yet we've been talking about them coming next year <laughs> for about 10 to 20 years. Instead, what we have are, we have automatic braking systems. That's a part of automation. So we don't need to pay attention to our braking uh, uh, as much. 
we have automatic traction control. So we don't need to, we, people are a little more aggressive uh, uh, because of it. Then we have different forms of cruise control that can uh, uh, help you with cars that are in front of you uh, or even keep you in lanes. Those are peeling off parts of the autonomy puzzle. Uh, th that's how this will evolve. That's a framework to have about what parts of your job are gonna peel off. But the skill to develop is, is being thinking about what's inside your head that's implicit knowledge and working to make that explicit and codified so that it can be related to others as part of a whole system. That then will be put inside of a puzzle in different contexts. And the skill, I will say, of the 21st century will be able to recognize those patterns and then redeploying those patterns uh, in other contexts. You see a pattern of technology deployment and redeploy that pattern uh, in another context. That's the opportunity uh, more generally uh, for people starting their oh, careers I today. Love that. that was magnificent. I'm going to be naive and blase, but I'm basically going to pretend that you just told me, continue podcasting, quit your day job. That's your implicit knowledge that you can make explicit, David. <laughs> Some of the... We're doing a great job so far. Just wait so till the second half, Eric. <laughs> Some of the listeners may have watched The Social Dilemma and unfortunately tied a negative bias towards the term AI. Where best have you seen AI used for common good and benevolence? Well, it's depending on how we want to define the, the technology. If we want to talk about it as an augmentation uh, to, to our own involvement, then I'm going to have as negative a bias as AI uh, uh, in my life as I do my calculator. You know, I don't have an aggression towards my calculator. Uh, I'm not pissed off that it can do uh, long division uh, 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 more effectively or faster uh, than me. Uh, and if we think of it as an augmentation to my tools, I'm also not distressed uh, uh, or depressed every time I have to use Excel. Uh, you know, I don't keep those models in my head with the same sophistication that is available inside of a uh, of a digital spreadsheet. It, it, it's, it's a little, it, it, it's silly in that, in that way. Uh, what we can be uh, uh, attentive toward is the degree to which the linking of these systems uh, manipulates us. That is upsetting. Uh, you know, that goes back to the beginning of our conversation where uh, I saw computers as having a, a freedom uh, available to us. Uh, and that's still where I would want to look. How does this how do computers allow me to be more human, to express more of myself instead of me being in some sort of uh, dead end job? Uh, you know, nobody automates what they don't want to have automated, right? Nobody, you know, nobody wants to do many of these jobs that existed. Or you know, a few people, or rather, I'll say it another way. There were a lot of jobs that people were happy to have automated because they were boring. They were, they were often dehumanizing. Let's get rid of that work and have more and more of our work be creative and be uh, be expressions of of humans, and 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 then be attentive to those those technologies uh, that take away our freedom. You know that there are food companies that know more about my physiology than I do, uh, uh, right? And they they know that I'm addicted to fat and salt, right? That I can't have just one potato chip or whatever, right? That that happens in digital technology, and we see the negative repercussions of that. And so that's our responsibility as as individuals. Uh, and, and our responsibility as society, where we have uh, given reactions to some of these uh, addictive or, or, or counterproductive technologies. Uh, we'll have to do the same with digital technologies. Fascinating, Eric. I don't know how much the appetite towards AI has developed over your career, but you spoke about how some governments didn't see the ROI when you were in office. And on an individual point of view, there seems to be a dichotomy of adopters and opponents. What do you think will be the jam in the middle of the sandwich to bring both these parties together uh, and minimize that divide? Because I guess it's based upon maybe our trust being abused at times. I don't know, maybe skepticism of existential crises. What do you think will bring these two camps together uh, and unify them? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And this is really foundational to, uh, to my mission and why I'm still engaged in this work uh, with, with and have the enthusiasm that I do uh, for this work. 
uh, how we bring that together is we have to have non-technologists uh, begin to engage in the conversation about technology uh, uh, such that they're, uh, they're comfortable in that, uh, in that conversation. You know, I, I was in Florida uh, during my time in, in the U.S. federal government with this group called One Robotics, First Robotics, excuse me. So First Robotics has these competitions among children uh, I think it may go up to 16 or so, but generally, you know, a lot of the ones that I saw were, were they're generally uh, uh, much younger. Uh, these children uh, interacting with these robot competitions. So they, they would build a robot. So you, you, you know, it was in this conference room in this hotel in Florida where uh, kids were, were given a problem, you know, shoot this ball through a hoop. Uh, and, and kids, I, let's call them 10 years old, were collecting its group of six or eight and were, were challenged over the coming months to collect as a team. Uh, to, to shoot a ball through a hoop with a robot. What was terrific for me was, at least in my observation, somehow, you know, the girls were, it seemed to have an outsized uh, role as the leaders of these teams. Uh, uh, and yet they were not, uh, they, they were not, in, in my observation, the ones necessarily doing the, the nerdy work, but they had this comfort of dealing with these other nerds that they were managing, essentially, in in uh, uh, raising the money to support their effort and, and, man and, and deliver the project on time and to, to the objective. And I really liked this, this to just a degree of confidence and comfort that these all these kids were developing in working together to solve a particular problem, regardless of the role that they uh, found themselves playing uh, in that particular team. You know, whether or not these people ultimately had technical degrees or non-technical degrees, uh, it, or 10 years out, they began to have a comfort in the discourse with their, uh, uh, with their colleagues, with their friends, uh, that uh, would allow them to give sub substantive input about how they wanted their technology to be expressed in the world. That's what I want to see uh, uh, for all of us. The, the technologists need to come a little ways, the non-technologists need a little come a ways, so we can have a conversation. We, we want to embrace the, the best of these AI technologies, because in many cases, uh, they can be life-changing. You also referred to them as life-saving at one point in your intro. How can AI save lives, literally? Well, the, the, the quick answer is through uh, autonomous cars, where uh, it, it, there's often a little bit of a misconception about autonomous cars in uh, uh, providing some value over uh, uh, drivers as a whole. And that's true. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of other things we can do to improve the safety of driving too. The, the, you know, we have recent examples when we talk about traction control. That's a type of automation. You can say it's a type of AI. It's not something we interact with the way we do with Siri, but traction control saves a lot of lives by making driving safer. Uh, uh, the, the, but AI can also make it more dangerous because people are doing things on their phone while they're driving that they shouldn't be doing. That makes it more dangerous. So this is a perfect example of, of automation either fulfilling uh, or detracting from making our life uh, a better place. What I'm going to say is something uh, uh, that has applicability in these more complex systems. We th think of an Airbus A380, the big, the big jetliner. You know, we we have talked to my company, Connects, has talked to the, the the this company and other aerospace companies where they can prove the integrity of individual portions of that airplane and others. But there is literally no way. There is no method to bring together the different modules, to bring, de bring together the different components in a provably complete, provably safe way. They are then left with bringing it o over engineering, uh, which adds cost, adds weight, uh, adds time, and then, and then just testing over and over once you have the plane together. You know, they have a good sense that it'll work, but they have to test and test and test and test. This happens not only for airplanes, it also, also happens for rockets. So that's you know, so the engineers at NASA tell us. They over-engineer these rockets because they don't have a provably complete model of what happens inside of these rockets. As these systems begin to get more complex, and whether it's rockets or airplanes, or whether it's our power systems, or one place which Conexus interacts is with this uh, public utilities working on a wind farm. You know, these wind farms, we want to optimize for the power delivery relative to the cost of production, you know, predictive maintenance and optimization of, of, of its deployment and so forth. That's a fantastic place 
for the future of these guaranteed integrous compositional systems. Uh, and that's where all of us can be uh, uh, playing a part. But that's a place where uh, uh, safety is, is paramount because the consequence of failure in power systems, in avionics, say nothing of the obvious rockets, uh, you know, is large, is large, is large. So these high consequence contexts, as they get more complex, they need a base of guaranteed integrity. And that, that we then go back to uh, the mathematics of category theory, which is the skill upon which uh, if I was to tell my kids some, some career advice, uh, I, I would place uh, place more attention. I love it. So how well regulated is AI? Should we feel comfortable and safe at the hands of these technologists? You know, I think all of us need to be engaged uh, in the conversation around regulation. This is a place that we can't uh, just wait for uh, regulators to uh, think about uh, AI, uh, that we, we, we need everybody on the field for this conversation is the way that uh, one of my colleagues uh, from the Obama administration uh, put it. Everybody on the field to have a conversation about how we want AI to be expressed. And, and I'll, I, you know, I wrote an open letter to the, the, the current US president uh, about what to do with AI as the uh, AI office was uh, uh, being established or being established in his administration. <clears throat> And that, that comes from uh, 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 the three points that I'll make that everybody can know and everybody can then have a conversation with. This will be, this will be good dinner party conversation for uh, uh, you know, the, their, their, their coming weekend. Uh, so one is the circuit breakers. Uh, I think we can all talk about when we want to have uh, circuit breakers uh, around technology. It provides a degree of efficiency to have automation. We can take a little bit of that away by having uh, circuit breakers and declaring where we want this automation to stop and have human intervention. Second are audits. There's a couple of ways to do this. There's a, a technical term, um, uh, technical way to do this, and then there's a kind of a less technical way. The less technical way is exposing the, the algorithm to, uh, to experts in the field. Uh, could be people like me or it, it, uh, it, people that are knowledgeable enough to to look at what was declared to have been done relative to what is being done by a particular algorithm. You know, did you claim to do this? Is the algorithm doing what you said it would do? You know, that's a, a way of auditing. There's also a the technical way, which is things called zero knowledge proofs. That gets a little technical, but it's like credit scoring. I don't know what goes on inside, inside of a credit score, but I know generally what goes on, what comes out. That's another way of judging this. We can, again, t peel away a portion of the efficiency gained from automation by auditing them. Two ways to do that. Then the third way is we can declare in regulation this requirement for provenance or lineage. Uh, where did that data come from? You know, how was that model generated? Uh, I want to be able to click through, uh, to use the, 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 the vernacular of the web, I want to be able to click through over and over and over and over and over until I can get to the base level data upon which a decision was made. So that's different from the, the algorithm. But where did the data actually come from? You know, too often we are we're just looking at one level and we kind of throw up our hands. Like, you know, I can't tell uh, where something came from or how it how it came about. And those are three ways uh, in which we can uh, manifest our desire to have more transparency in in how regulation uh, expresses itself in the world. Thank you for dissecting those three steps, Eric. I'm thankful for it. What are your own personal hopes and fears for the future? You know, my my fear is that uh, uh, people will uh, uh, have a reflexive uh, rejection uh, of of AI that could help save our lives. Uh, I my fear is that reflex of rejecting uh, uh, AI that could be for the good is uh, is rejected with a frequency that has. Uh, developers like me and companies like me uh, move towards customers that are not uh, uh, in in the in the in the sphere of of the U.S. or its allies. Uh, you know, this is a, this is for the, the safety of Western democracy. You know, Western civilization that I want uh, everybody to be engaged in the conversation and embrace what is worthy of embracing, uh, and with some degree of alacrity. Uh, that's my hope uh, for for AI that we can bring about the, the quick adoption uh, of these, these, these transformational technologies to make all of our lives better. 
Uh, and, and for that, we all need to be uh, engaged in the conversation. That's really my dream. And that, that's what I'm working to do uh, with our conversation here, uh, bring more people into the conversation about how we want AI to express itself. Are you optimistic about the future of augmented, augmented reality, virtual reality, but ultimately the metaverse? I think that what people are, are asking for, uh, I, I generally think of as uh, augmentations uh, to what they're already doing. If I can have a better experience of, uh, of our interaction uh, right now and the interaction that is experienced by your listeners, uh, that is, uh, that's all goodness uh, for me. I see, uh, and I, I, that also expresses itself by uh, uh, the, the heads up, the, the advances in heads up driving I often see on some of the newer cars. We we'll call that an augmented reality. Uh, I see a strong demand for that. Uh, I see uh, little to no demand uh, for people wanting to uh, put on goggles and immerse themselves for any length of time inside of, uh, of an environment uh, uh, for, for work or, or much else outside of uh, video games. I want to ask a personal question, Eric. Given that you've founded six startups, had the momentous career that you've had, when will you know personally when it's time to hang up the boots? When will you feel self-actualized? Because your career has been so decorated and illuminous. And you, like, most people would be able to stop at the point that you're already at. When will you know that your work is done? Oh, that's very kind. I... Uh, 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 really, am, uh, I don't want to use the cliche, I'm just getting started, but I, uh, I do think of people that I personally look up to that are engaged in this conversation. Uh, uh, so I, I think that you know, some, for some of us, uh, the work is never done. Uh, you know, the, the founders of DeepMind in the UK, uh, brilliant uh, individuals that, that I think are, are likely to uh, continue as far as, as we can see. Uh, uh, Eric Schmidt here in America, uh, with whom I'm, a, 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 um, who I know, he, he, he's a, he's a role model in engaging people in a conversation uh, about uh, about AI, uh, about these transformational technologies. Has a good book out uh, that I can encourage people to read, and that's uh, uh, that's a, a, an example of someone that uh, has has achieved a great deal of uh, a career success. You know, he also has a PhD in computer science. Uh, uh, from from Berkeley in his case, and he's still engaged in, in bringing people to AI. I, I could name more. You know, the, uh, uh, and, Andrew Ung uh, here in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, Kai Fu Li uh, in China. These are brilliant people uh, that that are continuing, and and I, I think continue to provide inspiration for me uh, as as I uh, try to bring more people into the AI conversation and 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 spread the gospel about category theory and composability. Eric, what do you do to have fun? How do you rest? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am, I am uh, blessed to have uh, 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 family and friends that I very much enjoy uh, spending time with in a variety of contexts. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we, the, the time that we're, we're talking about this, I'm about to uh, go celebrate midsummer with my, uh, my wife's family. I won't hold you for much longer, Eric. This has been a real privilege. This has been so much fun for me. Thank you for stopping by. Where can the people engage with you in this movement online? So uh, LinkedIn is a good, uh, you know, professional uh, uh, professional meeting place, I suppose. Uh, Connexus.com is uh, the, the website for Connexus. And uh, of course, in the usual uh, social media places, my Twitter handle is EAD, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn are Eric Daimler. I love it. I'll link everything in the show notes below. Like I said, this has been such a fun whirlwind of a conversation. I feel definitely upskilled. I'm sure the listeners do too. Thanks for just stopping by and for your generosity and all your generous work that you've put into the world. Thanks, Eric. David, this has been a good, good time. Thanks for the conversation.